Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Praise the Lord. Welcome, 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 and thank you for coming to another Fired Up About Our Faith. What a valuable, important lesson we have been going through. We're talking about, our title is, there is, our safety is in our sanctification. We're saying, and I need you to get this right from the beginning because i got a lot of ground to cover today. The closer you get to God, the higher you go in God, the safer your life will be, Meaning that you will find yourself in a place of deliverance. You'll find yourself in a place of being in your destiny. You'll find yourself in a place of enjoying your salvation. Because even when the obstacles come, you will know that they were just there, but they do nothing. Uh, they can do nothing. They have no effect against you because of where you are in God. Now, the Lord told me to tell you as we're starting this Bible study, the title is called Safe in His Arms. I'm recording this Bible study. You know, this is the day after the Derek Chauvin um, verdict. And I think that there was a changing of the guard as far as people of color understanding they are safe. I think the blatant act that was done by Derek Chauvin and George Floyd had the verdict gone another direction, it would have really doubled down on the fact that we as people of color are no longer safe in this country. I mean, with that kind of evidence, if there was not a guilty verdict, what would it take for us to feel like we were getting equality, that we were being uh, accepted, you know, that we were getting what we, what they call the fruits of living in a democracy such as the United States. So I can say this to all my brothers and sisters, we are elated by that because it's another step in the right direction. I'm saying all that to say that's what you need to understand about this lesson. God expects us to continue to go higher in Him. He expects us to get closer to Him and that's called sanctification. And our sanctification is where uh, sanctification, when we get there, we're going to look at all the areas of sanctification, but we've been focused on 2 Corinthians. If you look at that scripture, we had two scriptures as the basis of this teaching that I just need to go over really quickly. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Turn to that if you have it. Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to the next. We are to be going from glory to glory. Amen? And then Mark 8, 34 kind of brings that home because it says, Jesus himself said in Mark 8, 24, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life will save it. Then we found out, that that is the problem, that there are a lot of saints who find themselves in a position of what we call the sanctification gap. There are three biblical or theological steps involved in true transformation so that we can go from glory to glory. And that's what I shared with you last week, that this represents that sanctification gap, which is justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now, you got to go back to last week. We told you where they were, what they were. We talked to you about progressive sanctification. We talked to you about ultimate sanctification. And we talked to you about the positional sanctification. But tonight, we're going to look at something different. We're going to pick up the justification process or the sanctification process to find out how all of that becomes a reality. Colossians 3.3. 3. Right? 1 through 3 says this. If you have been raised with Christ, 
then seek Christ or seek that which is above. When you, when you were raised up with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. Colossians 3, 1, 3. All right, now, I'm getting ready to turn this lesson around so you can follow me. That was really where we left off at the end of lesson two. Tonight, lesson three, you can go back, check out lesson two, and you'll find out it has all of the bases of what we've been studying. But now we're going to go to lesson three, which is the reality of experiencing God. How do I? How do you, everything I'm talking about, glory to glory, feeling safe, understanding the ultimate, I'm positionally sanctified, I'm, I'm being sanctified by pursuing God, right? And then the ultimate sanctification is when I get to glory. But tonight, right now, God wants you to know you are safe as far as where your life is going because of who you are in Jesus Christ. And we were to look, I want you to know the reality of experience experiencing God. Now, as we know, there was, well, I'm teaching partly from a book entitled Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby and Claude King. They gave us seven realities. But when I talk about particularly sanctification, how do I go from glory to glory? How do I get better? How do I go get closer to God? How do I stop fighting the same battle over and over again? How do I get rid of some things? How do I reach my dreams? How do I get where God wants me? All of this is in sanctification. Once you decide my life is focused on getting closer to God, everything else in your life is going to come together. But now you have to have one of those upfront experiences. You have to have one of those moments where you experience God. And watch this. You should be pushing, you should be reaching to experience God every day. Now, I'm not going to talk about all seven realities, but the theme of that, experiencing God, I want to share with you how that experience of God takes us to our ultimate destiny and protects us along the way so that we're safe. Can you go with me to Exodus chapter 3? Exodus chapter 3. Let's go to Exodus chapter 3. This is the story of Moses. It's a story that we know, but it is the ultimate story to show after this God encounter, which we all had, you should have had an encounter with God somewhere along your life, uh, in a midnight hour, uh, in a crisis moment. All I'm telling you is, instead of looking around at the fear, looking around at what you don't have, you ought to be looking for God. God explained that to me one night. I found myself dealing with a very stressful, draining situation. And I sat there, and I was meditating on my stress. I mean, with all the Bible I know, with everything God said, our human nature wants to go back to just looking at what we don't have or meditate on things that are wrong. And God said, wait a minute, I'm here. He said, while you're doing that, think about the encounter or my presence. Focus your mind. I'm throwing this in for free, guys. Focus your mind on the God presence in your worst situation, and you'll be able to turn back any stress or any problem. God will be there to meet you because he's already present. We just got to refocus. We got to re God told me, refocus. I had a great night's sleep that night because I refocused on God and remembered the last time that I encountered him. Listen to this text. Now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro. You got your Bibles? Exodus chapter 3. His father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God unto Horeb. And the angel of Jehovah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside, see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when Jehovah saw that he turned aside, very important, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. Put off your shoes from off your feet. For the place whereun thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. 
and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Jehovah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people that are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. That's enough. Let's pick up from there. The reality of experiencing God, we notice that in John 17, verse 3, it says, And this is eternal life, that, you know, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I'm going very basic with you. Do you know God in the sense that you have a lasting relationship with God? Just like you walk with your wife or walk with your children or walk with your you know, brothers and sisters. Do you know God on that level? God wants us to know him. That way we get involved with the array of his power. So John said, this is how I get my eternal life. Eternal life. Abundant life. A life that is blessed down here and blessed when I go to glory. A life that says I'm filled with the anointing of God. I'm talking to people tonight who are filled with the anointing of God and nothing, no weapon, no obstacle should have you down because eternal life is in that moment when I experience God. A reality of knowing who God is. I'm trying to bring this thing home. You got to know God is sitting right next to you now. You got to know when you go to the hospital, God is there at the hospital. Whatever your circumstance Somebody say, I'm experiencing God because that's the kind of father he is. So the first point is, through life we've been given the privilege, the benefit of knowing God face to face through all of our experiences. So what is the first point of knowing God? We have to understand that God is always at work around us. Please hear that. You're crying, but God is working it out. You're fearful, but God is right there with you, working on what's going on in your life. As a matter of fact, he's probably worked it already. You just have to get to the place where your spirit man is prayerful enough to answer that. You need to understand that there are demonic forces out there, and there is the God force. You have to decide which force you're going to listen to so that your mind can be at ease. You can't go for short-term uh, what I call name it, claim it, this, this kind of uh, rambunctious, uh, when I call it rambunctious, because they'll just say anything, call it teaching, but it strays from the word of God. You got to say what God said. Get into the word to find out what's real and what is not real. So God is always at work in us. God did not create the world. I love this. And then leave it to function on its own. God did not leave us. He's been actively involved. That's important when I say that. God has been actively involved in history. He never left you alone. The good news is God is working because he is directing our lives. He's working because he's directing our life. Once you belong to him, there is safety in knowing God oversees bringing us together. Look at Proverbs 16 and 9. Go to Proverbs 16 and 9. Very important scripture. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, A man's heart divides his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Oh, stay on that. My heart, when it's, you know, the heart is evil. Uh, no man can contain it. My heart is what got me in trouble. My heart can lead me in a sinful direction. But God said, here it is. My heart divides the way, but the Lord directs his steps. Don't miss that. God is saying, even though you were headed in the wrong direction, because I'm always working, I've already figured out how to direct your steps. This is good news. You would not be where you are right now if God had not directed your steps because everything you were doing was taking you in the wrong direction. Amen, somebody. Everything I was doing was not leading me to God. But God somehow showed up because God is always working on my behalf. I want you to stay on that screen. I want you to see this text here. So how do we know? How does God do this? It's very simple. Moses. Look at that first verse. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. What was Moses who was going to be God's deliverer, doing at this point in his life, I'll tell you what he's doing. He actually had lived through some decisions, even though his life was blessed with God from the beginning, God 
He was following his heart, and eventually it led him back to God. But Moses, at this point, is a fugitive. He's a wanted man. He's broken. Uh, he left palaces, and he left all the riches of Egypt. And now he is one of the lowliest forms or occupation. He's a shepherd. How did he come from leading armies to being a shepherd? Well, we do know part of it was his choice, but also it was because that's what God designed for his life. Let's talk about our God encounter. How did you come from selling drugs, maybe being out there in the world, doing everything you wanted to do, and I'm not even going to hit all your sins. How did you become that sinful person to now where you're saying, I am a believer? I'm saying, I'll tell you how. God was working in your life. He guided your footsteps. Even though Moses was in the middle of a crisis, it doesn't make a difference what your circumstances are. God is still working to put you where he needs to put you. God is still working to put you where he needs to put you. That's the blessing in God. How we get through our circumstances is God's working. Our job is to recognize his presence and allow that work to go through our life. Look what Moses did. He was actually in a place where he was disillusioned. You know, he left Egypt, tried to be a deliverer in his own strength. I didn't even preach that, but you know, you've seen the Ten Commandments, you read your Bible, where he tried to be a deliverer on his own, and that's how he became a fugitive, because he ended up killing, him, killing another Jewish person and killing an Egyptian. All we know is Moses found himself a product of his circumstances, but God was not done because God was still working in his life, right? So how did that happen? Moses was chosen by God to be a deliverer. What? I'm telling you, you were chosen by God. What are you now? I don't know. First, you're a believer, right? I don't know what your title is, but did you know as bad as you were, with everything that was going on in your life, with the loneliness, with the, with the brokenness, with everything you've experienced, you were chosen. I want to tell you the power. Sometimes we overlook this, but we were chosen by God to do what we're doing. So when God chooses us, he protects us. When he protects us, he preserves us. When he preserves us, he guides us to where we need to be. Don't you ever think where you are now is where you're going to stop. There is a plan in place from God that started when he chose you to be what he chose you to be. Look at, um, look at verse 11, 23, right? We're going to the, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 23. God chose Moses to be a deliverer. When did he do that? Right now, when Moses is about to turn aside to see the burning bush? Nope. If you go to Hebrews, it says, by faith, Moses' parents, verse 23, hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. God is working all through that. There was an edict by the king to destroy all of the male children of the, of the Jews because they were growing, too, they were multiplying too fast. And Moses' parents were not afraid. I think they were affected by the Holy Spirit. They hid Moses because they saw he was a special child. God allowed them to see that Moses has, was a marked man, is what I call God marked Moses. Uh, God marked you for where you are. That's why um, I can remember when I had the car accident, and actually the car turned over three times when I was 17, uh, 18 years old, coming from my job. And I remember, I, I tell this story that I believe, because I saw it, uh, the car turned over. Um, I had been working a double, tried to work half of another shift. I was trying to make all this money I could. You know, when you first start working, for some of us with work ethics, I was working at a glass house. So I had been up straight, almost 24 hours straight. And I remember riding home from my job, and I fell asleep. The car hit a pole, turned over three or four times. The only thing I remember from that accident is I saw two angels, or angels, kind of dragged me out of the car. How do I know that? Because when I came to... I was laying on the side of the road and some cars had pulled over because they saw the smoke, the car was messed up. And I said to them, how did I get out here? Uh, 
how to get out the car. They didn't know. They said, just rest, just sit there. I knew, wasn't thinking about God then, but somehow God pulled me out of that car to preserve me so I could do what I've been doing the last 30 years. I, I believe that now. I know I saw two angels like sitting on the dashboard of the car. And they, uh, I'm getting chills now. They pulled me out of that car. When my mother saw the car before she saw me, it was total. I was in the hospital, get this. I had one little scratch and my arm was wrapped up. That car was total. The man, when the man asked me how to get out, he was shocked that I was not hurt. But I know that was God preserving me. I can name you a hundred. You got some. I'm just telling you to remember your God experiences. Just understand that from beginning of time, God preserved Moses. Moses was going to get to where God said he was going to get to because God preserved him. Now think about something. God preserved me so I could preach. I could have died. I believe the enemy tried to take me out. When penicillin came out, they gave me penicillin. Found out I was allergic by ending up in the hospital almost dying. I can tell you a number of times, but I believe the reason I didn't die, here it is, drum roll, I was chosen. John 15, 16. I don't want you to deny this. You've been chosen by God. You've not, he said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, that your fruit shall remain, and whatsoever you shall ask in the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So watch the text. God said, I was chosen and set apart. You got that, John 15, 16. What that means is, let's look at that. The safety is in that word, what he said. He said, I was ordained. The word ordained, when he said, I ordained you to bring forth fruit. The word ordained means I conferred a holy appointment on you. I invested my anointing in you. This is deep, guys. I gave you some holy orders that were deep in your DNA. So no matter what life threw at you, God said, because you're chosen, somehow, I'm gonna, let's go back to our first text, I'm going to direct your foot back to where I want you to be. He preserves us, right? So he preserved you. I just told you about my, my car accident, but 1 Peter 1, I mean 2 and 9 says this. Watch the text. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Uh, I'm talking about you. We sit there sometimes and let the world just beat us up. But look what God said we are. A holy nation. A peculiar people. That you should show forth praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You should praise him because you're royalty. Who was Peter talking to when Peter said this? I need you to know. Peter, if you go back to Peter chapter 1 of 1 Peter, it says to those the scattered the elect of God who had been scattered, the persecuted. Here's what God is saying. He wasn't talking to people who had it all together. He was talking to somebody who was under pressure, who had been scattered, who had been persecuted. What I'm telling you tonight is don't forget who you are. You're safe because of who you are, but you've been chosen by God. And I need you to see in that, in God choosing us, right? When God said you've been chosen, it goes into us understanding that he was talking about how we were chosen. 1 Peter 1 and 2, right? Elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit. You were the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Let's look at those terms for a minute. In 1 Peter 1 and 2. I told you who he was talking to, right? So first, God elected us. Election. I don't want to get into the whole doctrine of election, but understand, here's the reality. You know how we go to the polls and elect who we want to be in office? God had the same right. <clears throat> i got to share with this. God elected you. He chose you on the basis of his purpose. He elected you based on his purpose. So there's some people he did not elect. I don't know, I'm gonna show you why. But he elected you. So since you're the elect of God, that means God will preserve you. How did he elect you? His foreknowledge. Sanctification of his spirit. Unto obedience. And his will bringing grace and peace. What does it mean? It means that God elected me 
the doctrine of election said he chooses us based on his purposes. Yes, people have asked me this question. Why you should be so excited is because there's some people God does not choose. Remember the text when he said um, th that he had 12 disciples and he said, one of you I have not chosen, talking about Judas. Wait a minute, God, how do you get 12 disciples but one you didn't choose? That's what I'm trying to tell you. Everybody in church may not be part of the elect. We don't know that. That's why we pursue God. But what he said is, there's 12 of you following me around, but one of you, I didn't choose. It just reinforces that God chooses based on his purpose. So go to Deuteronomy. Let's read Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let me put it up there. I, I want to read a text here, and I didn't want to write the whole thing out, but I want you to see just a part of this text. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's talking about why God chooses for his purpose, right? So in case somebody said, that's not fair. Why does God do that? Watch the text. In chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, verse 6 and 8, God said, but be, I'll start at verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto Jehovah. Talking about God's chosen people. Why he chose the chosen of Israel. Um, chosen to thee to be people for his own possession. Above all peoples that are on the face of the earth. I chose you above everybody else. Jehovah did not set his love upon you. Nor choose you. Because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the fewest of all people. He said, look, Israelites, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest number, and it was a great number, and you know how to have a great big army. He said, you were the fewest. God always chooses that which is the fewest. He said, but because Jehovah, here's why he chose us for his purpose. Watch this. But because Jehovah loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, has Jehovah brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God said, the reason I chose you is because I love you. And in Romans 9, I'm not going to read the text because you know it. But in Romans 9, verses 9 through 13, talks about Jacob, I love, Esau, I hate it. He said, I chose Jacob over Esau. Remember, God chooses us for his purposes. God has all knowledge, so he chose Jacob, even though we look at what Jacob did to get where he was, you think Jacob is the worst of all of them. No, Jacob had something on the inside of him that wanted God, and because God elected him, God said, I elected to love Jacob, and the elder shall serve the younger. I love that. God is letting us know that he chooses whom he wants. So, after God chooses us, right, he calls us. Let's look at the, Exodus, the second verse of Exodus here. It says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. One of our greatest assurances, God, is the condition in life is the condition of our salvation. Watch it. So the bush didn't burn. An angel appeared. Um, I have there, God always shows up once we belong to him. Moses might have thought, Moses was 80 years old. My life is over. First 40 years I wasted in Egypt. The next 40 years I'm here in the desert. But God waited until he was 80 years old, showed up to take him back to his destiny. Don't ever think you're done. Don't ever think you're... I'm talking to somebody right now. Don't ever think you're out. Don't, God has a way of, of taking us to a place and blessing us where you should never, ever think that it's over. Never, ever think that I'm done. I want you to see that because God always shows up once we belong to Him. I can show you countless times, countless times where God showed up because we belong to Him. Uh, but if we look at Exodus 3.39 in Moses' calling, it said the angel of the Lord showed up. Moses went and saw the fire. Mark Moses said, I'm going to turn aside and see this. So when he showed up, God appeared as an angel. After God chooses us, elects us to preserve us and bless us, he calls us. Look at verse 10. 
Come now. Therefore, I will send you unto Pharaoh that thou may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, God. How did it get from me being a fugitive shepherd, didn't even own my own sheep, to you saying, you get ready to send me to be the deliverer? <laughs> I don't know. How did you get to where you are now? How did you come back from being, uh, you know, drinking alcohol or running the street? Whatever your condition was. How did you get from being that fearful person to being the person you are now? You got there because God said, I chose you. Now I'm going to call you. I chose you for my purpose. Now I'm going to call you into that purpose, Moses. Moses said, I stutter. I can't go. You know all the excuses Moses made. God said, you don't have to worry about that. Because once I choose you, I equip you. Can somebody hear me right now? You have the ability to defeat anything that's coming against you right now. You have the ability to defeat any demonic force against you. You don't have to worry about the spirit of suicide, the spirit of depression, the spirit of stress. None of that. Because I'm safe when I'm within the arms of God. When I continue to pursue that reality of that experience of that face-to-face -face presence of God. And I realize something. I'm a chosen generation. I have been called to a place of victory where God will equip me. And once I get my calling, God equips us through that blessing. So, we found out through Moses, God came down to bless us, to preserve us. He called Moses because he was ready for Moses to do what he said. Now, I need you to see this because we're about to close tonight. But I need you to see that we're going to pick up here. This is good teaching, guys. You're safe when you get sanctified. I'm telling you right now, the safety in your life is because you are constantly pursuing or chasing after God. And that's when God blesses you. Look at uh, the second thing we're going to look at is God pursues a continuing love relationship with you. That is real and personal. God pursues a love relationship with you. God created mankind for love, a relationship with him. More than anything else, God wants to love us. And once we know that, we will find out that our, our first blessing comes from loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our body. What does this say? Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We are safe tonight in sanctification because of our positional sanctification, because God is leading us. He justified us. Now he's leading us to glorification. But now I have to have a reality of experiencing God. You're sitting there tonight experiencing fear, you experience everything else, but you won't tell yourself, I need to experience God. So we're going to pick up next week with this point of another, how do I get that reality? First, I got to know God is working. Now I got to understand that work comes because of his ultimate love for me and my love for him. So come on, say it with me before you sign off tonight. I am saved. This Pastor Duncan, please go to our our website, um, go to our Facebook, go to Instagram, go to YouTube, check out our channel, SBC Praise Church on YouTube, check out the messages, they will bless your life, don't forget, catch up with these lessons, this is the third installment in understanding your safety, God has ordained, God has directed me to talk about being safe because we're in a world that is closer, that is getting closer and closer to that prophecy of the world falling apart, but tonight every believer is safe. Because you're chosen, you've been called, and when, that, when God had that safe, that face-to-face -face experience with you, you were blessed. But check us out, put something in the chat, let us know you're listening to the messages. God bless you, I will see you next week. And remember, I am safe. You live a safe life, not to get on you, because you're in the arms of God. God bless you.